Our topic tonight is the Gospel of Thomas and Q. Um, this is one that we have been uh, planning to do for a little bit of time. We were going to do this before I took our Spain trip, uh, and then we were going to do it at, while I was in Spain, but then I realized I needed to bring a lot of books in order to be able to speak on this topic. And I know a lot of you are saying, well, you should, this should be a wake-up call. You need to be uh, getting all your books on Kindle and so forth, and who knows, we'll see if that happens. Right now, I use paper books often. So, um, we have previously explored uh, the Gospel of Thomas. We have a couple lectures on it, actually, one that has uh, been very well received, one of our most watched lectures, and the same thing is true for Q. And I guess it goes without saying, if you're actually watching this uh, YouTube channel, that this has nothing to do with the um, modern, popular, preposterous QAnon conspiracy theory Q. This is Q, the uh, Kvela, the source, the Q document that biblical scholars uh, are talking about when they are uh, attempting to explain uh, differences and connections between the Synoptic Gospels. We'll talk about that. So this presentation, because we've had those two past lectures, is really only going to summarize those earlier findings and conclusions. So today, we are going to look in depth at uh, sayings that overlap between Thomas and Q. So these are both sayings gospel documents in order to explore whatever the relationship is between these sayings gospels and also so that we can see what they tell us about the underlying oral tradition that presumably links us back to certainly early, the early Christian movement, the proto-Christian movement, pre-Christian movement, and the historical Jesus. Okay, so just by way of a summary background, uh, there are four canonical gospels in the Christian New Testament. Um, those are the ones that made it in and were organized and were pretty well understood as canon by the uh, official Roman Christian church as it emerged and was organized in the 4th century, uh, even though the canonization of the whole New Testament still took another while even after that. Um, so only four of the many, many Gospels that were in circulation in the 1st and 2nd and even more as the time went on, centuries, only four of these were included in the official canon of the Bible's New Testament. You know, again, all of the books were written independently. They weren't ever meant to be a Bible together. They got put together to create a Bible uh, after the fact, centuries later. So we call these four texts Mark, John, Luke, and Matthew. Uh, and so I've taken that artwork that we have there of Mark, John, Luke, and Matthew. And how do I know uh, which one is which if we're having sculpture like that? Or like um, a couple weeks ago when I was taking pictures of the, uh, the cathedrals in Seville and other places in Spain, and we see the four evangelists on the walls and so forth, how do we know who they are? And so the answer is, is that they always have attributes. So uh, artwork in the medieval an ancient Christian and even the modern uh, Christian artwork has uh, symbols where each of the, um, let's say, apostles and also the prophets and also the evangelists have uh, characteristics that help you, can, you know, pick them out. I mean, if you've got 12 apostles, they all kind of look the same, but you realize, well, he, Peter's carrying keys and so forth, and that's how you um, can pick him out from some of the other ones. So in that same way, the four canonical evangelists always pictured with a winged living creature, as it's called. So Mark is pictured with a winged lion. And that's why, for example, um, in Venice, the Republic of Venice, its symbol is the winged lion. And there is a, a winged lion on the top of a column there. St. Mark's Basilica in St. Mark's Square in the middle of Venice because um, the Republic of Venice um, went and grabbed, they claim anyway, the, the bones of, or, uh, of Mark the Evangelist from Alexandria once Alexandria had fallen to the Muslims, and that became the symbol of their republic and their city. So a winged lion. Um, 
you know, John's symbol is a winged eagle. Eagles all have wings, so it's kind of just an eagle. <laughs> uh, Luke's is a winged ox. And uh, Matthew's is a living creature, but the creature is a man. So it's a winged man, so like an angel is essentially. They are maybe all angels, but um, a kind of angel and that sort of thing. Those are the, those are the four symbols of the four, four evangelists. Um, you can see that throughout all of Christian artwork. It's one of the most common Christian motifs if you go around and look at um, again, medieval cathedrals and so on. So this is the illuminated manuscript on the left, one of the very most famous ones, the Book of Kells, um, from the Celtic Church, the eight, year 800. Four living creatures. Where are the symbols of the evangelists come from? It's drawn from the Book of Revelation, chapter 4, uh, verses 6 through 8. And we read there, around the throne, the throne of God, and on each side of the throne are four living creatures full of eyes in front and back, sort of like the idea of uh, Argus in the um, Greek mythology, uh, a creature that uh, is covered with eyes and so forth. Uh, the first creature, living creature, is like a lion. The second living creature is like an ox. The third living creature with a face like a human, the fourth living creature like a flying eagle, and all four living creatures, each of them with six wings are full of eyes, and all around and inside, day and night, without ceasing, they sing, holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So um, a very, one of the things about the book of Revelation is it's, um, uh, the Christian scripture doesn't have like a lot of amazing imagery, except for until you get to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is problematic in lots of ways, but it does provide all kinds of both visual imagery that becomes uh, used in Christian artwork, and it also provides um, kind of hymns like this. And so that holy, 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 that's in a lot of uh, Christian hymns ever after. So that vision um, predates the canon. So in other words, I said how those, those become symbols of the four canonized gospels, but in fact, the book of Revelation was written, let's say, at the end of the first century, around the year 90 or 95, somewhere in there, and therefore roughly contemporary to when uh, the evangelists or independent evangelists are writing Matthew, Luke, and John. So it's later than Mark, but it's centuries before the canon of the New Testament was created together. Uh, and so, you know, there's no particular reason to imagine that there were going to be four, you know, canonized gospels and so forth when Revelation was written. And so the vision of the four living creatures predates the fact that the church chose later to canonize four gospels. And therefore, the equation of these gospels or evangelists with the creatures is one of these later traditions. And so if you just watch Christian art, you'd presume that that's what the that's what they mean in Revelation or whatever. We already, it means those four uh, evangelists, those four gospels, because uh, it's totally, those gospels are totally associated with those living creatures. That's symb a symbolic association, but it's a later traditional association. It has nothing to do with the, uh, when the person was writing it at the time. And in the exact same way, that the assignment of each gospel to a living creature is a later tradition, so too are all of the names associated with the gospel texts. So the original text in every case is anonymous. Um, they are not written by Mark, John, Luke, or Matthew. And indeed, since none of the gospels, as we've shown in lecture after lecture and all these things, you know, none of them were written by eyewitnesses to Jesus, um, they specifically weren't written by Mark, John, Luke, and Matthew, who are all characters within uh, the gospel tradition who would have known Jesus, the historical Jesus. So we don't know the names of the actual authors, but we can state, like I say, with confidence that they aren't written by anybody who knew the historical Jesus. So these are anonymous texts in Greek. And as we've said a bunch of times, although Jesus and his disciples would have used Aramaic as their native language, uh, we don't have, none of the original um, writings of Christianity are in Aramaic. They're all in Greek, including these four texts. And all four of these texts include serious anachronisms. 
because they, uh, like all texts do, they share the perspective, the time and place and understanding of their authors, their individual author, rather than the earlier time they're narrating. So, you know, any of us, um, even if you're writing historical fiction now, now that we have access to so much, uh, you know, amazing, um, say if you're trying to write, I don't, it doesn't have to be fiction, but let's say you're trying to write a historical story that is set in the time and the past, no matter what you would do now, even with all of the um, uh, amazing access that we have to historia, you know, historiography, historical information, anything like that, I defy you, anything, anybody tries to write something like that and they're going to introduce anachronisms. It is very difficult uh, to avoid that. Certainly back in this time period, before all of those historical tools were invented, when they didn't have almost any of this kind of information and when their goal was not to write a history in any of these cases, but rather to write theological texts, um, um, they were not writing uh, things that are um, the way things were at the time of Jesus and the disciples, they're writing things the way they are and they understand them to be in their own times. So, for example, John, as we, call, as we say, the gospel attributed to John, this text is written after Christianity has been dividing from Judaism. So at the time of Jesus, um, Jesus and his followers are all Jews and they are part of a sect of Judaism, part of Second Temple Judaism. And then over time, um, then if, over the course of the first century, as um, other Jewish sects become less, um, they just get more and more tired of this Christian sect and continuously, Christians continuously saying that and, you know, Jesus was the Messiah and so forth, you know, they kick them out of the synagogues and so forth. And then when that happens, uh, Christianity starts to emerge. The, the name Christian is coined. It's coined many years after Jesus' death. So Jesus never called himself a Christian, nor did any of his followers in his lifetime do call himself a Christian. Uh, it's only later that Christianity emerges as a separate religion um, from the other sects of Judaism. So for example, though, in the Gospel of John, which is written after that divide is happening, they will quote Jesus, or Jesus will talk about, he'll talk about the Jews. Um, you know, this is uh, total, totally something that people in the community where the Gospel, the author of the Gospel of John lives, they are talking about their now um, people that they've separated from. They're now thinking of themselves as Christians and they're now thinking of their former co-religionists as the Jews. That is not something that Jesus would have ever said. Um, and so anyway, that perspective uh, is totally anachronistic and the gospels all have anachronisms like that. So there are problems with the historicity, especially of the narrative elements or the events, the actions that are taking place in the Gospels. So Mark is the earliest narrative Gospel, maybe written around the year 73 or something like that. But the story of, or 70, right in that air time frame, but the story of Jesus' ministry uh, beyond the bare bones, as we've talked about in our lecture on the historical Jesus of his baptism, teaching the fact that he had disciples, he taught disciples, and that he's executed by the Romans, by crucifixion. So anything beyond that already indicates um, two ways where uh, Mark's narrative diverges significantly from the historical Jesus. So uh, in the one hand, uh, the author of Mark prefers to retroject visionary experiences of the risen Christ back into the narrative of Jesus' life and I'll have an additional slide of what that means. And the second thing is that the author of Mark uh, likes to fill in any unknowns. So anything that uh, he does not know about the details of Jesus' life, um, he feels uh, very, uh, it's very legitimate practice to fill in those details with content drawn from the Hebrew Bible, from the Old Testament. So we'll explain how and why. So according to Paul, the very earliest Christian writer whose works survived, writing to the Corinthians, um, he, 
he says, I, I'll, I'll pass on to you what I've learned as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised, and on the third day, according to the scriptures, uh, and he ra was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, which is to say Peter, and then the apostles, et cetera, et cetera, all of the appearances that the risen Christ made. And so, um, so this is a central testimony that Paul is having. He's not recording very much in any of his writings about uh, what, anything that happened in Jesus' life. But what he's really saying here is a really important Christian testimony is that everything he did do was according to the scriptures. So, like I say, Paul preserved very few details of Jesus' life, uh, but everything about it, he testified, as an authority for early Christians, was in accordance with Scripture. And so we've talked about this before, how since the canon doesn't exist, none of the Gospels have been written when Paul is writing. Um, therefore, the Scriptures that he means is not the Bible as we have it. It's not the New Testament. Rather, he's talking about... Uh, the Hebrew Bible, that's the scriptures that Paul means when he says the scriptures. So he means the Old Testament, and specifically he's referring to the Old Testament as it's been translated into Greek, the Septuagint. And so in writing the first gospel narrative of Jesus' ministry, like I say, when details are lacking, which it does seem like is almost the whole thing, the author of Mark very much feels at liberty to look to the Septuagint, to look to the Old Testament, see what the Old Testament has to say about the Messiah, and then about other figures that uh, Christians associated with the Messiah in order to find out what those details were. And since, um, as a matter of faith, uh, Christians like Mark and Paul uh, assumed that every single thing uh, that's in the scriptures, uh, Christ lived according to those uh, points, then it's perfectly um, acceptable to simply take those and put them together in order to create a life narrative for Jesus. Um, so the fact that, again, the historicity is so problematic, this is one of the reasons that people sometimes erroneously jump to the conclusion, well, that means there was no historical Jesus. No, that's not the case. Um, there's ample evidence, we can say, um, all, effectively all scholars agree uh, that there is a historical Jesus. There are a couple outliers that have uh, made, a, made a, a career out of saying otherwise, but uh, with, that, with those exceptions, um, yes, there's a historical Jesus, but the thing about it is, is that we can't for sure say that very many of the details of, the, of Jesus' life as recorded in any of the Gospels, um, have historicity. So just a couple examples of how Mark, for example, is doing this in the Easter story. So um, the there's a character essentially in the Psalms of the innocent sufferer. So as the psalmists in different Psalms, like Psalm 22, um, is talking about um, you know, crying out to the God of, of suffering, this is seen as, um, as a, again, a precursor of the Messiah, how Jesus would have lived according to scriptures. And so there's a text in Psalm 22, they divide my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And so when Mark is talking about Jesus uh, um, upon the cross, uh, talking about the soldiers who crucified him, it says, and they crucified, it, crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. So, so there's no particular reason to think that um, there were any eyewitnesses necessarily, uh, um, you know, Christian eyewitnesses that are writing this. The disciples have all fled in most of the narratives, not in um, John, uh, which is, has almost least likely to have any historical relevance to anything, but anyway, uh, to be almost an entirely theological story as opposed to this. But anyway, Mark, the earliest one, there's um, the detail here instead is not from a witness, it is from um, the Psalm. And you can even see, you know, divided my coats, cast lots for my clothing. It's, it's very, you know, it's a kind of a clear detail. Likewise, um, 
in Psalm 22, uh, one of the lines is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So the innocent sufferer asks that. And at three o'clock, we read in Mark 15, when Jesus on the cross cries out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So in other words, it's a quotation from this. Jesus is saying that as his last words in Mark's gospel narrative, because that's what the innocent sufferer says in Psalm 22. And so throughout the entire text, actually, the author of Mark supplies details from the Septuagint to create the narrative story for Jesus' ministry. Okay, so we have that on the one hand going on. We have another thing going on, though, that we've talked about with the origins of early Christianity, which is um, a significant component of how Christianity is even spread initially is by people preaching in the Spirit. So after Jesus' execution, his female and male disciples begin having visionary experiences of Jesus. So Jesus raised from the dead. This spread to people who had not even known the historical Jesus, like Paul, a guy who originally named Saul, who identified the risen Jesus, we had a vision of, with Christ, the Messiah, as the incarnation of God's glory. And so this is a, um, a theological innovation within Judaism. Um, you're not able to see uh, or picture or, or um, say the name of or, you know, anything, you know, the, you know, God, the creator. You're not able to make a statue of, no, make no graven images and all those sorts of things. You're not supposed to say the name aloud and that kind of thing. But you can see... Uh, the glory that, uh, of God. Um, and so you can see, for example, God's wisdom. You can see um, all of God's creation. All of these are effects or um, components of God. And so the idea here now is that all, that is already a pre-existing theological concept all across the Old Testament. And now Paul is asserting that Jesus is the Messiah who is the incarnation of God's glory. And so it's not that far a removal from the rest of Judaism and how it would understand anything. It's just that one little additional in innovation. So Christianity then is spread by mendicant apostles in pairs, people who are going without purse or script. They're not bringing um, food they're, they're, or, or money, but they're going around to go preach uh, the good news of, of Jesus, the teachings, and so forth. Uh, Jesus has conquered death and these kinds of things. There's a kingdom, uh, inclusive kingdom of God on earth that reverses all of the iniquities or the unrighteous, unjustness of the Roman kingdom and so forth. Um, they are going around in, in pairs preaching by the Spirit. And so that will include sharing essentially visionary experiences or sharing their testimonies of visions that they've had uh, with the risen Christ and so forth. So since most of the testimonies of apostles speaking of the Spirit are shared about Christ, most of those are visions of the risen Christ, the stories over the course of the next few decades that are best known in the Christian community, they naturally post-date the life of the historical Jesus. They're about the risen Christ. They're not about the historical Jesus, who's frankly less important in the early Christian community. Certainly Paul doesn't talk as much about what Jesus was doing in his, in his regular life. Per, because of his particular take on the apocalypse then, which he believes is underway, the author of Mark, um, retrojects these visions into his narrative. So Mark, as we've seen when we looked at that gospel, doesn't want to have, uh, you know, unlike the other gospels, unlike almost all Christians, Mark doesn't like this idea that people have been, you know, seeing the risen Christ. Mark thinks the end of the world is happening right now. The Romans are destroying Jerusalem, the temple, and so forth, right when he was writing that text. And he is a literal apocalypticist, and he thinks that Christ has not come again visionarily or any other way. And he thinks instead that Christ is about to come again. And this is a big sign of it. And so his um, polemic text, the text that almost all the other Christians don't agree with that, um, and actually find that uncomfortable, and they don't like how Mark's um, book ends as a result of that. And so they write different endings for it, and they rewrite Mark's text. Uh, nevertheless, 
because Mark is the first one that has a narrative, people decide, well, we do like a narrative, and that's interesting to have. And because he takes all of those visions and retrojects them into Jesus' life. So suddenly, when Peter and James and John, let's say, have a vision of Christ in glory on a mountain, and they see him with Moses and Elijah, that may be a prominent vision. But instead of it being a vision after Jesus' death and resurrection, a vision of the risen Christ, that now is brought by Mark into the narrative of when Jesus is alive, and, and then potentially also the Jesus's baptism uh, vision is another one of these. Uh, the idea of seeing Jesus walking uh, on the Red Sea—I'm sorry, on the, on the Sea of Galilee. This is like um, potentially, probably initially, a vision that apostles will have had of the risen Christ. And now that makes its way instead back into the lifetime of Jesus. That part we don't know for sure, but anyway, it seems to be um, how this got written the way it did. In other words, not by anybody. Um, you don't have to have weird explanations of, of how you explain. Like Some people want to have these things where Jesus only appeared to be walking on water. He's walking in a shallow part of the gap. See, this, isn't, this not, doesn't make any sense at all. That is not what's happening. And it's not because people are just making stuff up or lying. It's that people have had these visions, and now it's being written in such a way in terms of the author of Mark's understanding um, that it took place in the lifetime of Jesus as opposed to um, being a vision of the risen Christ. OK. so. While all of these processes that we're talking about, all of these things make reconstruction of the actions, the deeds of the historical Jesus very problematic, very difficult to reconstruct, there are actually reasons that we can be a lot more hopeful that we can reconstruct the teachings of the historical Jesus with more confidence. So early writings preserve many teachings of Jesus that take the form of things like clever maxims, aphorisms, and also parables, um, all three of which are kind of things that are able to survive through an oral tradition. And um, by contrast, uh, whereas some Christian communities, like Paul's communities, didn't particularly value whatever the acts or deeds of the historical Jesus were, you know, at least in the early years of when Paul is running around, many of the early Christian communities actually did value Jesus' teachings. And so we have, again, reason to believe that, uh, that those have been preserved uh, better, even if memory of, let's say, that most of the details of Jesus' life were being forgotten. So how does oral tradition work? So like the Iliad and the Odyssey of Homer, the Quran in Islam, is composed orally as poetry, and as such, it's something that can be memorized and repeated. And uh, there, of course, then, when you, that's happening in the oral tradition, there can be lots of variations of the text before it's finally written down. And so um, there's all kinds of reasons to believe. There are variants of um, you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey. There are different uh, versions of it, and what we have is not going to be what it will have originally been like, because there are ways that, if you're going to memorize an epic poem of that length, you're not really memorizing it. There are ways that you are um, you're memorizing parts of it, but there's also formulas for expanding and changing it as, a, as an epic poet. Uh, and likewise, you know, there's all kinds of reasons to believe that uh, uh, there's a lot of variation in the Quran in the first many generations, and it is only under the later caliphs that, um, or the caliphs that, uh, that the thing is standardized and brought to what we have today when it is um, fixed and finalized. So um, those are for epic poems. Like I say, though, um, that's not what Jesus taught. So he didn't write a poem, an epic poem, but he did write sayings. Um, that are, had ways that were easy to be remembered and transmit by his disciples via uh, oral transmission. So Jesus, as I say, taught in Aramaic, but all of our earliest texts are in Greek. So it was once thought that Matthew, for example, was composed first in Aramaic, and what we have is a Greek translation. Um, that's based on a statement by an early Christian named Papias, but um, 
literary analysis shows that is not the case, so we're either misunderstanding Papias or he was just simply wrong. And so we are fairly distant from Jesus' sayings, but um, again, there's more reason to be hopeful here than with the historiography or the historicity. Uh, so Jesus' spoken teachings, there are decades of oral tradition and a language jump from Aramaic to Greek to have them written in documents like Q, which are lost, and then have that to be in turn um, used and written, by, written into uh, Matthew and Luke, which have survived. So the sayings circulated, like I say, for decades and then jumped before being recorded. So while oral transmission has the capacity to preserve sayings intact, you can continuously you know, use an aphorism like a penny saved is a penny er earned, or you know, I cannot tell a lie. On the other hand, you know, you can, you can, those can also change, you know? So there are variations, as we know, of, um, of things like ring around the rosy, a pocket full of posy, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. Um, that's the way I was taught that nursery rhyme. It has a very different variations in England and so forth, different places. Uh, it has been remembered, going back to the same one has been, uh, the oral tradition has been different in different places. So uh, oral tradition can also function like a game of telephone where each hearer changes the saying uh, when, it's when it's their turn to teach it. So we've seen before that we have uh, across the canon, canon of Gospels and then also in Gospels that are extra canonical, we have uh, alternate versions of the same saying. And so we have a saying about the last being first. So one of these in Mark is many of the first will be last, and of the last, many will be first. And that one, uh, Matthew takes uh, directly uh, following Mark, which is one of his, his sources, and brings that into Matthew. But Matthew also has a different variant of that in a different section, where it is simply a much more simpler version. The last will be first and the first last. We have in Luke one that says, and remember those who will be first are last and those who will be last are first. And there is um, another version of this in Thomas. There's other versions too. But in Thomas we have, for many of the first will be last and will become a single one. So we can see here anyway how um, a game of telephone has taken a first and last kind of saying about first and last and has preserved variants in these different forms, including in this one case here, multiple different uh, versions that are in the same gospel. So how does it work? So Matthew has a doublet there. So Jesus has an aphorism, like the last will be first and the first will be last. That's going through oral tradition, ultimately, um, you know, people who have learned that in Aramaic, they are now Greek speakers, they go on missions and they to convert Greek speaking uh, people in the uh, Eastern Roman world. Uh, and those uh, then to transmit that and so forth. At a certain point, one of those versions is recorded in Mark, like I say. Another one of these is recorded in this hypothetical lost sayings gospel Q. Matthew, the author of Matthew, who has access to both those texts, has brought both of them into his gospel, potentially editing them if he wanted to as he's doing that. So that's how we have, uh, how, why we will have doublets, for example, in the same text, in a single text. Okay, so now I've, I've introduced the idea of Q and Thomas. Let me just go through what each of those are. So the Gospel of Thomas, is perhaps, what I would argue anyway, what I think is, the most important extant text that was left out of the New Testament canon. So, um, you know, by say extant, that means that we actually have, right? And so, if we had Q, I mean, Q would probably be more important, <laughs> just so that we would know, um, uh, because we would, it would confirm a lot of things for us as scholars. I mean, having Q would be, um, you know, almost as big a deal as, as having, uh, the J source of the, of the Pentateuch, of the Torah, if there is a J source, which is less certain um, than you know, the Q source. 
So not to be confused with the infancy gospel of Thomas, the sayings gospel of Thomas was lost for many centuries before the recovery of a Coptic translation of the text at Nag Hammadi, Egypt. So Coptic is ancient and medieval Egyptian as part of a larger library uh, of texts that were dug up in this area near a, uh, uh, an ancient Christian monastery. Uh, where a library, often sometimes called a Gnostic library, because of a, the kind of interests of the people who were burying these texts, um, include a bunch of Gnostic texts. And so um, they're not all Gnostic texts, and some people will argue that Thomas specifically is not a Gnostic text, although it has many proto-Gnostic or Gnosticizing directions to it. Um, but in any event, whatever people want to argue about that, uh, that text has now been found. Meanwhile, Q, if it did exist, remains uh, lost. So the synoptic problem. So long before the rediscovery of Thomas, biblical scholars demonstrated that what the three synoptic gospels, so Mark, Matthew, and Luke, they're called synoptics because it means they can be read together because they are very, very similar, they overlap uh, in content, by contrast to the Gospel of John, which is very different indeed. So, I mean, if just if we think of, you know, for example, Jesus teaches in parables, except for not in the Gospel of John, he doesn't have any parables. So, it's a very different uh, overall kind of uh, format and even order of the narrative, and there are contradictions between the synoptic narrative and John's narrative and so forth. So. Textual dependence, there's a, there's a relationship between them which is literary textual dependence, which means either all three of these share the same lost source, so there was some kind of original gospel, and uh, each one of these uh, evangelists have uh, deleted parts of that and only copied down parts of that <laughs> source in order to make theirs, so that's uh, kind of a weird idea that to happen, or um, one is the very earliest one, and then uh, uh, and the other two are copying from that one or using that one as their source, and again deleting and or changing things from it. Or um, one is the original one, and then the second one changes it, and the third one is using either the first two or just the second one or something like that. So in other words, there is some kind of a relationship, but it's not. These are independent people who have participated in the oral tradition and, uh, and then are just writing down their own eyewitness account or something like that. They're not eyewitness accounts. Rather, somebody has got, um, you know, at least two of these have at least one of these <laughs> in front of them as they are, um, as they are uh, writing their text because they're copying it directly. It's not an oral thing. It's a literary dependence. Okay. So nearly all scholars agree at this point that the most likely scenario is that Mark is the um, earliest and that Matthew and Luke are using Mark as their source. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's very hard to argue it any other way. So you have to, you, it, uh, Mark is uh, kind of the simplest and has, it has most problematic and it also has um, uh, you would ha it also is missing a lot of these wonderful things that the other ones add, and you'd have to, you have to argue essentially that um, Mark, if he's using one of the other two as his original source, is condensing it and is throwing away things like the Sermon on the Mount. Oh, nobody's going to want to read about that, <laughs> you know. And so there's all these things that um, uh, it make it very unlikely that it's any other way around. So Mark is the earliest, but. Because Matthew and Luke share material that is not found in Mark, like the Sermon on the Mount, uh, and again, those things that they have in common that aren't in Mark, there's still literary dependence. They must have had an additional lost source. And so the most likely scenario, or the most commonly accepted scenario, is some variation on the two-source hypothesis, which states that uh, there was Mark as the original narrative gospel. There is a lost source, or Kfela in German, Q. That's where we get the name Q. A lost source that we don't have of Jesus' sayings. And then the authors of Matthew and Luke 
have access, independent access to both of those, and they use both of those independently in order to craft their own gospel narratives. So there's objections to this hypothesis. So one of those is there are additional minor agreements between Matthew and Luke that require explanation. Um, I think these can be solved uh, fairly readily by kind of pointing out, in most cases, you know, like Matthew, I'm sorry, Mark will make an error. So Mark, as I say, is getting a lot of Mark's narrative by, for example, quoting the Septuagint or Old Testament, but Mark doesn't know the Septuagint very well and will make a lot of misquotes often. And so Matthew and Luke, who both have access to the Septuagint, will go back and correct Mark. So that has nothing to do with Mark. Uh, their changes will then have, they'll agree with each other because they're making a correction, but it will um, uh, not be what's in Mark and it doesn't have to be with any, it's in Q either because they are correcting errors that Mark is making, uh, that kind of thing. However, um, the primary objection beyond those kind of minor points of agreement that people point out is the fact that the source, the lost source, Kfela Q, is lost, <laughs> you know? So in other words, we don't have it. So it has to be totally hypothetical. And so when you have something that's hypothetical, that remains, that's why this remains a hypothesis, even if it's, let's say, the most likely scenario. So prior to the discovery of Thomas, the recovery of Thomas at Nakamati, there had been scholars who even objected to the idea of a sayings gospel because we didn't really have any sayings gospels either. So, because the Q source would be strange, it would just be a collection of sayings. But now Thomas has actually demonstrated, well, no, there were independently circulating collections of sayings. And so, as a result, uh, because of that, after Thomas was recovered, there were some sort of initial hopes uh, you know, it's written in Coptic, so not everybody can immediately access this thing and understand it. Um, there are some initial hopes, well, maybe this thing actually is Q. Maybe the um, sayings gospel Q has been found. So this, you know, as a spoiler alert, this did not prove to be the case. So Thomas isn't Q, and we'll kind of show why uh, in this lecture. But nevertheless, both Thomas and Q, you know, as Q can be reconstructed from what we understand, you know, we have reconstructed the international Q um, symposium, uh, you know, reconstructs it based on their uh, literary criticism reading of Matthew and Luke, uh, that both of these seem to preserve literarily independent witnesses to the sayings of Jesus. So Thomas and Q then seem to be uh, another, another strands of witnesses along with Mark, John, independent Matthew and, and Luke in material that isn't in either. And then other New Testament writers like Paul, like James, and so forth, uh, various other texts that are left out of the canon. So in other words, different witnesses that can kind of bring us back to teachings that may be traced to the historical Jesus. So um, what we're going to be doing to now for the bulk of the presentation is comparing sayings in Q and Thomas. Um, and so again, we'll, to get to Q, we have to like see what, ha what Matthew and Luke have included, and always what ends up happening is that those authors, um, they don't bring it in intact necessarily. They also correct what Mark is saying, and they change it a little bit, and so forth, depending on their own understanding or editorial or thematic choices that they want to make based on their testimonies, their theology that they're trying to present. So we'll compare Q and Thomas, but we'll have to use Matthew and Luke to do that. So we were talking about these sayings, the first and last. And so we're skipping now the ones that are in Mark and derived from Mark. But Matthew from Q has the saying, the last will be first and the first last. Luke's version from Q is, and remember, those who uh, will be first are last and those who will be last are first. And then Thomas's version of this is, for many of the first will be last and will become a single one. <laughs> so we saw that since Mark also preserves the saying independently, then Matthew had a doublet that is derived from Mark other than, you know, in addition to this one from Q. So um, knocking out the, um, the Luke one here, because uh, the Matthew one is so much shorter and a better and pithier and so forth, it's, 
it's also the most jarring. So um, one of the things that happens with these sayings is you want to have apologetic softening. You want to have qualifiers like many. When you're saying, um, you know, no rich man will ever enter the kingdom of God or something like that, you, that's a tough teaching. And a lot of times when you're preaching from the pulpit and there's a rich patron in, the, in your congregation, you may want to change it. Most of the rich won't be, you know, won't make it into the kingdom or something like that. Or it's, it's really difficult or something like that. You want to, you want to soften uh, the teaching. And so instead of the last will be first and the first last, it might become many of the first will be last and so forth. So that is um, why I think Mostly scholars would argue that the, the simpler and more jarring one is more likely to be the original. Um, the Thomas variant then also shows signs, as we're going to see, as we're going to see again and again when we look at Thomas statements of the compiler, the author of the Gospel of Thomas's own editorial interests. And one of those is this idea of becoming a single one. And so rather than... Um, this is a variant of a saying. It, a, 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 re, a real pithy saying is going to be said, the last will be first and the first is last. <laughs> if you're going to say, if you change, you're changing it or making a variation on that when you're going to make it be like, many of the first will be last and they will become a single one. That doesn't, that's, you can see um, you're taking a, a, let's say, a, a known saying and you're now giving it a new spin, but it's unlikely to be the original way. And especially, like I say, because so many of the sayings have had this kind of um, editorial uh, change in Thomas, or even some of the sayings in Thomas that are unique or original to Thomas also are like this. Okay, so here's another example. Uh, the teaching on the poor and the kingdom. So in Luke from Q, we have, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And again, this is a rough one. You know, we're saying it's fortunate. How fortunate are you who are poor? Uh, yours is the kingdom. So Christ is one of his whole things is he's talking about the kingdom. The kingdom is um, almost the idea of the community and everything else. And that's for the poor. Um, and so Matthew um, maybe found that teaching to be uh, difficult. And so it wants to soften it or spiritualize it. And so it makes it blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom. And so, uh, and another, another change that often happens, Matthew likes to say of heaven instead of kingdom of God. And so almost always is changing the source probably to make it uh, for that phrasing as opposed to kingdom of God. So um, if we read uh, Thomas, for example, that is another maybe confirmation uh, that the Matthew in one is Matthew's editorial changes because again, we don't have poor in spirit, which is hard to understand what that even means. People, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? Does that mean you, uh, you are weak spiritually? And that doesn't make any sense because why are, why are those weak spiritual people uh, um, blessed? You know, so it, isn't, it doesn't easily make sense. Um, anyway, and so that's not in Thomas's version either, Thomas 54. Okay, here's another uh, collection of sayings, a uh, collection of sayings that go back pretend, presumably to an original somewhere. So Luke 19, 26 has from Q stuck on the end of the parable of the talents um, when uh, a Lord gives, uh, who's going on a journey, gives his different servants a certain numbers of talents and so forth. At the very end of that, um, the, the one who'd been given more and, and did well uh, it was rewarded. The one who'd only had one and buried it, hadn't done anything, uh, has it taken away. There is then at the end of this a saying, I tell you to everyone who has, more will be given. And from those who don't have, even what they do have will be taken away. And there's a very similar variation of that in Matthew that is also from Q. So this saying is preserved separately in Mark. And as a result, both Luke and Matthew include doublets. So on the one hand, it is attached to this parable. That parable is not in Mark. And so there's a, a second uh, iteration of each of these drawn from Mark in Luke, uh, in addition to this one uh, attached to the parable of the talents. So um, here's the version in Thomas. Jesus said, whoever has something in hand 
will be given more, and whoever has nothing will be deprived of even the little they have. So there is no parable of the talents, uh, like I say, which is only found in Q, so that's not in Mark, it's not in Thomas. Um, nevertheless, Thomas preserves this variant of this have and have not saying, which is an interesting pithy saying, although it doesn't, it's a weird teaching in a way, it's a harsh teaching, right? That um, we're not necessarily sure, you know, you, there are all kinds of different explanations of what you could have for this teaching, and many Christians have made all kinds of different uh, ideas for it. But in general, it's just an uncomfortable uh, saying, and an interesting saying, um, that has now survived and has been circulating independently of the parable, which may have been joined by an editor of Q. And so what this again starts to make us be aware of is uh, in this oral tradition of circulating uh, parables and independent pithy sayings, even when we're getting back to the level of Q, there's still um, an author and there's still editorial decisions and themes that are being made. Okay, here is another um, saying, or in other words, a and there's an original saying, and we have all of these different variants, right? So there's a saying about having faith to move mountains that's preserved in Mark, in Q, and in Thomas. So Mark places the saying after a story where Jesus has cursed a fig tree. So Matthew, who follows Mark, who uses that as one of his sources, includes this variant. Uh, Luke deletes that variant. Uh, Luke is less likely to include Mark in material than Matthew. Matthew includes almost the entire book of Mark. Uh, Luke is more willing to editorially change or divert from Mark. Um, at the beginning of Luke's gospel, Luke, there even is a, Luke, the author of Luke even says, there have been so many people that have written uh, gospels or written about Jesus, and they've not done a very good job, and that's why I'm writing one now. Um, this seems to be an editorial comment on Mark, which Luke doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, likes some of the ideas of, but doesn't like it as, a, as an overall text. So this gives Matthew a doublet again on this saying, uh, as both uh, Luke and Matthew include a variant from Q. So Luke's from Q variant is in chapter 17, and it says, the apostles said to the Lord, make our faith grow. And the Lord said, if you had trust no larger than a mustard seed, you could tell this mulberry tree, uproot yourself and plant yourself in the sea and it would obey you. So um, this is the only one that has mulberry trees. <laughs> Every other instance of this, um, the, the faith, you know, when you have faith uh, a size of a mustard seed or whatever, a tiny amount of faith, uh, uh, you can move mountains. <laughs> Uh, and so for whatever reason, it seems that Matthew, I'm sorry, that the author of Luke has actually edited and downsized the object into mulberry trees, and it's not clear uh, why. <laughs> and frankly, the idiosyncratic reason uh, that the author of Luke chose that maybe it's just too unbelievable that a mountain could get moved. But really, I mean, if you're gonna move, make, mentally move or whatever, you magically move a tree is almost the same thing, and from my perspective, it makes it less visually interesting. So um, Matthew from Q places this in a different literary context. So after the disciples were, had been unable to exercise a demon, this is one of the things that Jesus routinely does, and this is a case where the disciples tried and failed to do that. Later, the disciples came to Jesus privately and asked them, why couldn't we drive it out? So he said to them, because of your lack of trust, I swear to you, even if you had trust no larger than a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be beyond you. So we'll look at the faith to move mountains in Thomas. In Thomas 48, Jesus says, if two make peace with each other in a single house, they will say to the mountain, move from here, and it will move. So, um, like I say, in Mark, in Q, and in Paul, uh, who actually talks about if he had faith to move mountains, so he actually refers to this and is aware of this teaching too, the idea of moving mountains is connected with the idea of faith or trust. However, faith is not as important a theme 
to the author of Thomas. And so the Thomas variant here in, in identifies this impossible feat, moving mountains or moving mulberry trees in Luke's gospel. Moving mountains is not about faith, but it's with making peace. And so this seems to fit, like I say, with that over to overall editorial goal of the author of Thomas, whose regular themes include two becoming one, becoming one and so forth. So if two make peace, essentially they're becoming one, right? That's gonna give them uh, the power to move mountains. Okay, so I've mentioned here about doublets in Matthew and Luke. So we have this initial oral tradition, a saying that whatever the originally goes back to historical Jesus or to other um, leaders in the early Jesus movement, John the Baptist, Jesus' brother, uh, James the, uh, the Just, and so forth. Sayings with independent witnesses in Mark and in Q. So that saying will have a version in Mark and there'll be another version in Q. That will sometimes result in doublets, like I, well, we've just seen in Matthew and Luke, because sometimes Matthew especially will preserve both sayings. And sometimes Luke will too, although sometimes one or the other of them will delete one of them because they've already got a version of that uh, from the other source. So, and Thomas will also have a variant of the saying. However, what we're going to find out is a closer examination on Thomas, that there are also doublets within Thomas and even triplets within Thomas where a single saying is preserved in two or three forms. And so that implies that there is actually probably a complex editorial development before we get to the present Thomas, the version that we have. And so there might be a very earliest version of Thomas that is lost still, just like there's a lost Q and there's earlier versions or source texts behind the Gospel of John and so forth um, that again have to be hypothetical and we have trouble um, identifying or piecing out for sure what they were in um, way less assurance than we have with the hypothetical of Q even. But in any event, we want to just kind of even say there's probably a bunch of complex development to even get to where we are with Thomas because of these doublets and triplets. So here's a couple examples. So there's a, a saying cluster about seek and find. And so Luke 6 has, again, drawing from the Q source, since we're comparing versions here of Q and Thomas, uh, has, so I tell you, ask, it'll be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it'll be opened to you, open for you. Rest assured, everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And for the one who knocks, it is opened. There is a, um, a variant of this that's very, very similar from Q in Matthew. And indeed, there are, um, there are actually other attestations of this ask and, and you will find uh, variations, including, including some from James and so forth that are uh, also not dependent on, the, on Q. So Thomas's, uh, one of Thomas's variants of this is, Jesus said, one who seeks will find, and for one who knocks, it will be opened. And so that's very similar to, you know, a part of the Q version here that we have in Luke and Matthew. We don't have, you know, we have the seek and find and knock and open. We don't have the um, ask one as part of that, but, and we don't have the, the assurance at the end. So it's a smaller, uh, simpler variant of it. Um, Seek and find, uh, though, is also a doublet, has a doublet in Thomas. So in Thomas 92, we have this variant. Jesus said, seek and you will find. In the past, however, I did not tell you the things about which you asked me then. Now I am willing to tell them, but you are not seeking them. <laughs> so that's an interesting twist and very different in terms of uh, an addition to this. So um, this has additional edit editorial material, which, I mean, which seems to fit the author's, again, editorial program. So in this case, Jesus is offering to tell disciples secret teachings that he was previously unwilling to share. And so we should point out that, you know, again, as this gospel is either proto-Gnostic or Gnosticizing or Gnostic, um, the idea of 
knowledge, secret knowledge, that is what gnosis, this is what is central to the understanding of Gnosticism. So seeking and finding is important and that may be one reason why um, there are so many variants or doublets and, and even actually a triplet in Thomas. So in Thomas 2, we have another variation of this where we read, Jesus said, those who seek should not stop seeking until they find. And when they find, they will be disturbed. And when they are disturbed, they will marvel and will reign over all. So Thomas 2 here seems to be an expansion of the seek, find saying that makes it even more, making it even more in tune with Gnosticism. You know, seeking and finding is pretty, in, you know, already in keeping with Gnostic, the Gnostic idea of Christianity, but um, you know, you're, this is your keep seeking, and then uh, when you find then the true knowledge, when you find gnosis, the tr meaning of life, you're going to be disturbed to find out what that truth is. That truth in Gnostic Christianity, you know, in a very shorthand, it's, it's a lot more complicated than this, but essentially the material world that we feel and touch and seems to exist in this sort of thing, this is very much less real than the true world, which is the spiritual world, the immaterial world, um, and so on. When you find that out, you're going to be, you know, you're disturbed. You're going to be freaked out because you thought everything, you know, that is material is what matters. Actually, nothing, matter doesn't matter. Uh, and when you have that insight, you have that a real truth or awareness, um, that's when you're going to marvel and you're going to be a reign over all because it will allow you to essentially exercise, you know, mind over matter, right? All right, so now let's look at another, um, again, teaching that we have multiple variants of, Jesus as the cause of division. Um, this one is um, often cited as, uh, you know, kind of the, you know, the counter example of the non-peaceful Jesus, right? And so in Luke 12 from Q, we have Jesus saying, I came to bring fire to the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. Do you think that I've come to bring peace to the earth? No. I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three, they will be divided. Father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. So boy, causing division, including family squabbles. Um, there is also a version of this from Q in Matthew. Uh, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father and a daughter against her mother and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. So um, Matthew's version lacks the part about the world being on fire, uh, the part about the division of three against two and so forth. And it has, rather than Jesus bringing division, Jesus bringing a sword, um, which is often you know, seen as a very violent metaphor, although um, almost certainly here as elsewhere uh, throughout the New Testament, the image of the sword is the word, you know, so the gospel itself, the message is the sword. But in any event, um, it's still talking about not peace, but division that will result uh, with, with these kinds of teachings. So. Um, there are, as a doublet, again, here in Thomas, where uh, different sayings are recording parts of this Jesus as the cause of division saying. So in Thomas 10, it reads, Jesus said, I have cast fire upon the world, and look, I'm guarding it until it blazes. So that's similar to part of the Q uh, saying that's preserved in Luke. And then in Thomas 16, we read, Jesus said, perhaps people think that I have come to cast peace upon the world. They do not know that I have come to cast conflicts upon the earth, fire, sword, war. For there will be five in a house. There will be three against two and two against three, father against son, son against father, and they will stand alone. So Although this doublet of sayings in Thomas, you know, relates to a very difficult saying preserved in Q, you know, so which Matthew and Luke, not sure maybe what to make of it, they are themselves editing it. 
Um, there's no particular literary dependence here. Thomas is preserving different parts of it than, than, are, in, than are in Matthew and Luke and so forth. And so as a result, it seems like Thomas is neither um, a harmonization of Matthew and Luke, in other words, something that's dependent literarily on Matthew and Luke, nor though is it the text of the missing cue, since it's not preserving the whole thing that uh, Matthew and Luke are drawing from in Q. So just keep on going through some more of these. So hidden and revealed. They're saying, there's a saying of about things hidden and revealed. Uh, Matthew following, taking from Q, after talking about um, a bunch of complex about teachers and students, Matthew has Jesus say, so don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of teachers, potentially talking to students, but maybe just everybody. After all, there is nothing veiled that won't be unveiled or hidden that won't be made known. So Luke has the same saying that is being drawn from Q, but Luke is putting it in a very, very different narrative complex. And so Luke says instead, has Jesus say instead, guard against the leaven of the Pharisees, which is to say their hypocrisy. For there is nothing veiled that won't be unveiled or hidden that won't be made known. So this hidden and revealed um, thing has more, uh, more context within doublets that are both, there's again a doublet of this just within Thomas itself. So Thomas 6, uh, we have another version of this, his disciples asked him and said to him, do you want us to fast? How should we pray? Should we give to charity? What diet should we observe? Jesus said, don't lie and don't do what you hate. By the way, don't do what you hate. This is a, that's a part version of the golden rule. Because all things are disclosed before heaven. After all, there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed and there is nothing covered up that will remain undisclosed. And then there's a doublet, like I say, of this, the same saying, uh, just much more simply in uh, Thomas 5, Jesus said, know what is in front of your face and what is hidden from you will be disclosed to you, for there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed. And so you can even see in that last one, here is again this Gnosticizing editorial uh, that the Thomas author is making. You know, we're not just saying everything hidden will be revealed. You actually, you're actually supposed to have knowledge, and the more you, you know, um, the more you are essentially having knowledge in front of you, that'll be disclosed, and nothing hidden, nothing that's hidden will not be revealed. So, all right. So let's just uh, take a break from reading all of these sayings and their different variations for a second to just kind of think about what we've learned so far already. So the narrative contexts here, as we can already see from these examples, you know, they're in very, the narrative context for the very same saying uh, is extremely different, right? So Matthew takes this hidden revealed saying from Q and connects it to a, you know, a, a something Jesus is making a point about teachers and students that I think isn't actually very clear or well connected. Luke, by contrast, takes the same saying from Q and connects it to hypocrisy, which makes a lot more sense about um, don't be a hypocrite because anything, you know, what you're saying will be revealed. Uh, while Thomas has two additional contexts, the first of them is avoiding lying, which makes the most sense at all, of all, so you're going to get caught in your lie is one of the ways you could understand this saying. Um, and then there's also, though, um, adding Thomas's main narrative goal, which is to say the admonition to gain knowledge. And so taking a well-known saying and using it, uh, reinterpreting it essentially to the, the author's main theme. So there's all kinds of ways, in other words, there's a free circulating well-known saying attributed to Jesus that is being, um, uh, that context is being created for in the case of each of these uh, texts. So as we're seeing, the various editors create different narrative contexts based really on their own favorite themes in order to introduce the saying. And so really for all of us, this should be an additional illustration if we needed one, that while the narrative stories in the gospels, they lack historicity. They are the inventions 
of the writers who are introducing ways to, to frame together sayings, for example, the sayings have more potential to be traced to the historical Jesus via the oral tradition. Those are the things that all have a, a, a common thread through all these, right? Okay, so let's look at a couple more of these and, uh, so that we can see how that, what I mean by that. So Matthew 13 has, again, from Q, uh, a version of a saying about the kingdom and leaven. And it reads, he, Jesus, told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and concealed in 50 pounds of flour until it was all leavened. And uh, Luke has a very um, similar variation. Uh, the, the main difference is, it's just the phrasing. And instead of saying the kingdom of heaven is like, uh, it's just put into a kind of the form of question, what does the kingdom, God's kingdom remind me of? Um, and there's another version of this in Thomas in 96. Jesus said, the father's kingdom is like a woman. She took a little leaven, hid it in dough, and made it into large loaves of bread. So the kingdom is like a woman, it's like the leaven, and so forth in, these, uh, in this saying. And you can see um, they're fairly, the idea is fairly similar, and we can kind of trace to that, uh, you know, as it's transmitted here. Um, there's an interesting one here about the coming of the kingdom um, that uh, this is one of the verses of scripture that Leandra quotes the most. <laughs> so, um, because anyway, there, it's an interesting one. So Luke t coming possibly from Q. We don't know for sure this is from Q because there is no variant in Matthew, uh, but some people in the Q um, society, you know, the International uh, Q Society have identified this as a Q passage. So when asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, you won't be able to observe the coming of God's kingdom. People are not going to be able to say, look, here it is, or over there. On the contrary, the kingdom of God is right here in your presence. Um, so like I say, there's no Matthew version, so it's not certain this is in Q. It could simply be Luke and material, Luke only material. Um, the reality is, is that, you know, again, we know that we, since we had Mark, we know that Matthew and especially Luke are deleting things out of um, Mark. And so we don't know for sure how many things uh, in Luke and Matthew singly were not actually also in Q and they just deleted it and the other one just deleted it, right? Um, because we only know when, that it is Q when they both have uh, a, you know, a variant of the same. So for this same passage, uh, we have variants, we have doublets in Thomas again. So Thomas 1.13 uh, says, uh, his disciples said to him, when will the kingdom come? And he replies, it will not come by watching for it. It will not be said, look here or look there. Rather, the kingdom of the Father is spread out upon the earth and people don't see it. So that's very similar to what Luke has. Uh, Thomas 3 has a variation. As a doublet here, Jesus said, if your leaders say to you, look, the kingdom is in the sky, then the birds of the sky will precede you. If they say to you, it is in the sea, then the fish will precede you. Rather, the kingdom is within you and outside you. And this is one of those sayings where there's even a triplet. And so Thomas preserves another version of this. His disciples said to him, when will the rest for the dead take place? And when will the new world come? And he said to them, what, are you looking, what, what you are looking forward to has come, but you don't know it. So, um, so what's going on here? So Luke, either from Q or from special Luke and material, along with Thomas have some sayings here about the kingdom already being realized spiritually. So this is opposing a alternate Christian take that was very much uh, alive at the time, um, uh, which is that the kingdom will come in a future time in history in a very literal way when the world will be destroyed, you know, so apocalypticism. So um, what we have clearly uh, within the canon, 
uh, and also among other early Christian communities like Thomas, we have both variations here. We have some Christians who believe that the kingdom is already here among us and we don't see it and so forth. It's already, you know, Christ has already come again and, and that kind of a thing. That is also uh, the central author of the Gospel of John also believes that, although one of the other authors of the Gospel of John is a, um, a very literal apocalypticist like Mark, like Paul. And so, again, this argument between those two views, you know, Matthew maybe deleted this part from Q, because Matthew doesn't think the kingdom is already present or something like that. So this is an argument uh, that was being had in the first century, and it certainly continues to the present in Christianity where there's all kinds of literal apocalypticists. There's also people like myself who you know, believe in uh, a spiritualized kingdom that's already present. So. Okay, parable of the dinner party. This is another, um, so this is the last one I want to explore. I just want to explain, examine this one because I've been using um, short kind of pithy sayings and those are, those are the ones that, you know, as we kind of understand how those would transmit by, um, you know, like this telephone game through the oral tradition. Um, the parables can also go that way, but you can see um, why they would also potentially, um, you know, have additional potential for change. And so we have uh, from Q again, we have variants in both Luke and Matthew of a parable of a dinner party. And there's a version of this in Thomas. And it's long, so I'm not gonna read Matthew's one. I'll just read the Luke and one to represent Q. So Jesus told him someone was given a big dinner and invited many guests. At the dinner hour, the host sent his slave to tell the guests, come, it's ready now. But one by one, they all began to make excuses. The first said to him, I just bought a farm and I have to go and inspect it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five pairs of oxen and I'm on my way to check them out. Please excuse me. And another said, I just got married and so I cannot attend. So the slave came back and reported these excuses to his master. Then the master of the house got angry and instructed his slave, quick, go out into the streets and the alleys of the town and usher in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the slave said, sir, your orders have been carried out and there's still room. And the master said to the slave, then go out into the roads and the country lanes and force people to come into my inn so my house will be filled. Believe you me, not one of those who were given invitations will taste my dinner. So, um, you know, there's essentially a, a narrative here that's fairly, you know, has a, the original part here anyway has a, you know, has a three-part harmony to it where you, you know, different, different guests are saying no, no, no for different kinds of reasons. And then it's flipped around so that essentially um, instead of having these wealthy people of property being, you know, the last one are going to be first and here kind of thing, instead of having these great ones who you assume are going to be um, the dinner guests of this amazing party, instead they get, it's an inclusive party where the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame, these are the people for whom the kingdom belongs, right? And so that's a, a parable essentially of, of Jesus's teachings. Um, there is a variation of this in Thomas, um, which even has like way more uh, people who are given excuses. So <laughs> Jesus said, a person was receiving guests. When we had prepared the dinner, when he'd prepared the dinner, he sent his slave to invite the guests. The slave went to the first and said to that one, my master invites you. That one said, some merchants owe me money and they're coming to me tonight. I have to go and give them instructions. Please excuse me from the dinner. The slave went to another one and said, my master has invited you. That one said to the slave, I've bought a house and I've been called away for a day. I shall have no time. The slave went to another and that one said, and said to that one, my master invites you. That one said to the slave, my friend is to be married and I'm going to arrange the banquet. I shall not be able to come. Please excuse me from dinner. The slave went to another one and said, my master invites you. And that one said to the slave, I've bought an estate and I'm going to go collect the rent. I shall not be able to come. Please excuse me. The slave returned to his master and said, those who have invited to dinner have asked to be excused. The master said to his slave, go out in the streets and bring back whomever you have to dinner. Buyers and merchants will not enter the places of my father. So, so we have here um, two variants of the same parable. They're not the same in their details, as you can kind of see. Um, Matthew also has a variant that's derived from Q that's more similar to Luke's, but is also different. 
because of, again, the editorial uh, interests of Luke and Matthew. So we can see uh, how the details are different and actually each has, uh, has added editorial conclusions. So uh, specifically here, it's, a, it's way more about all the different ways you can be a property owner and, uh, and that that's not you know, how you get into the kingdom is the purpose of the, the parable as it's told here in Thomas. Whereas Q uh, and in Luke puts way more focus on all the people that are gonna get invited uh, into the inclusive kingdom, the poor, the outcasts, the people on the margins, and so forth. Okay, so to sum up, um, while Thomas and Q are both primarily saying gospels and they have very limited, let's say minimal connecting narrative, there is some connecting narrative, their contents, it turns out, are different. So uh, Thomas is not Q, so we did not find the hypothetical lost sayings gospel when Thomas was recovered. So while they do share a number of sayings, there doesn't seem to be literary dependence. So at times the Q variant, as we've kind of seen, seems closer to what the likely original saying would have been. And at other times the Thomas variant maybe seems more likely uh, to be like the original one. And in both cases, you can see why uh, Q or Matthew or Luke or Thomas uh, why the editor has maybe um, changed the saying themselves or given it their version or how they understand it or their own um, uh, interpretive spin putting on it and so forth. So while a number of the sayings, as we have seen and we've kind of gone through at length, there are more overlap than what I've, I've read. I wanted to just give you kind of the central ones and a sense of it. While there are a number of sayings that are found in both Thomas and Q, and as we saw, some of these are attested in Mark and other sources as well. Many more sayings in Thomas have no parallel in Q. And then interestingly, they have parallels in Mark or in John. But, you know, so it's interesting, it's like a, it's a Thomas and John only, but not Q or, or, or Mark and so on. They have in Lucan special material in, in Thomas or Matthew in special material, but you know, not, not in Q, not in Mark and so forth as well as other New Testament, um, like Paul or James or something like that, and also extra canonical sources. There are fragments of, of lost gospels and so on, and there can be, there are parallels between sayings in some of those and uh, Thomas and so forth. And that's also true for Q. So in other words, um, all of these are kind of in, independently um, overlapping with the other kind of independent witnesses for uh, Jesus sayings. And so there are also within both Q and Thomas sayings that are unique to either Q or Thomas. And in general, those are ones that represent, let's say that community's own themes and witness. Uh, and so the Q uh, source is especially kind of focused on uh, Galilee and kind of peasants kinds of issues, not thinking about cities and those kinds of things, uh, thinking about the poor a lot and so forth, the uh, not thinking about uh, resurrection and that kind of thing, whereas Thomas, as we've seen, is thinking about becoming one, it's thinking about gaining in knowledge, um, other kinds of spiritual priorities that are incumbent in proto-Gnosticism and later Gnosticism. And so um, that is my kind of shorthand anyway of a, a kind of attempt to uh, look at and compare it and contrast the sayings as we see them in um, two of my favorite uh, New Testament uh, texts, Q, which is obviously the reconstruction of Q, and this Gospel of Thomas, the most important uh, saying that has been left out of the canon. So we have some Q&A, let me see. Sounds like um, a way to understand pseudepigraphy is to think of early Christians as good faith propagandists. Um, yeah, well, I mean, so in a sense, uh, they are, I mean, we could use the word, I mean, propaganda is kind of a, um, would, I think propaganda comes out when you have a, uh, like let's say a, a controlling institution. So, um, so we call them, I think, apologists, which is to say people who are, um, biased and who are presenting their perspective. 
uh, and they're not and they're writing their opinion of it. Uh, so I would guess I would say, yeah, I would say that they're apologists who seem to be, yes, um, operating in good faith, uh, but it's not, um, in terms of pseudepigraphy, in a lot of cases, these are just anonymous texts, and they aren't, they're not pretending, generally speaking, they're not pretending to be uh, anybody, although some of them, some of the, when we're going to get to the pseudepigraphical texts, so people who are pretending to be, um, let's say, Peter in the epistles of Peter, uh, or, or James in the epistle of James, and so forth. Um, yes, that would be, we would say then, people who are writing, uh, who are not Peter or James, who are attempting to write in using their authority, um, and, and, and I'm not trying to justify that. I don't think that writing pseudopaper, I don't think that doing that is leg legitimate ethically, um, but a lot of people were doing that at the time. In the case of these gospels, they are all, um, I think, initially anonymous. Uh, I don't even think that people believe that the Gospel of Thomas, the collection maybe didn't originally have the name Thomas attached to the top of it the way it is, although it do is worked into the first uh, title now at the front. Uh, the N.A. Works asks, were the parables of Jesus also passed orally like sayings? They have a much more prose-like quality, but they seem specifically to come from the mouth of Jesus too. So yeah, I didn't, you probably asked that before I got to the very end when I, because I hadn't done a parable. I hadn't, I just hadn't used, been using the examples of the parables because they're really long to read. <laughs> and by the time I get to the end of one, you might forget what details are in one or the other as opposed to the pithy sayings. But yes, um, you know, some of the ways that you could do that, again, is if you have a, you know, like you'd use a, you use a thing of the way that um, your mind works where you have, you know, like the rule of three, where if you do three things, one person, you know, did one, one did the next, and one did the next, and then you have the three results or something like that. Um, it's easy to remember things when you, when you put a parable together into a, uh, a story structure that works like that. Um, we had in that very last parable, um, in the Q version that Luke had, uh, we had that same thing happen with three guests. And then the, the version that was in Thomas, there just started being too many guests. You don't need to, you've made the point already once you've done three. Once you, the way the human brain works is once is an oddity, twice is a coincidence, three times is forever. So you don't need to have a fourth person that also, you know, is going to go collect rent or something like that. That's too many. It's making the parable too long. Uh, and so that's probably wouldn't make it, wouldn't be original for a transmission purposes. So like you say, um, uh, so many of the parables, um, for a lot of people, you know, so, so you're saying it seems specifically to come from the mouth of Jesus too. Um, I think that, uh, I think most scholars of the historical Jesus do look at the parables um, as being among the most, you know, authentic, generally speaking, among the most authentic. There are some that, um, that where a parable does seem to be, let's say, might be a Matthew and only parable or something like that, that has only Matthew's interests or something, and so that maybe doesn't isn't as likely because it's not multiply attested. But in general, yes, the multiply attested parables, um, and even some of the ones that are that are only like in Luke or something, uh, do seem to come from the mouth of Jesus as we understand the historical Jesus. Uh, Leah van Ur Sick says, "Did the Gnostics also believe Yahweh from Judaism was evil?" and uh, held us back from the non-physical archons, et cetera. So, so there are multiple different kinds of um, Gnosticism, and there are, um, and including there, is Jude there were Jewish Gnostics and Christian Gnostics, and, um, and, and there, were not, you know, there, there were Gnostics who were Christians who wanted to purge all of Judaism from Christianity, and there are Gnostics that you know, went on from that to, um, Anyway, that are that are that are that are more freely purging different distinctives out of Judaism and Christianity, you know, uh, from the history and the background. So yes, in a lot of cases, um, uh, a bunch of the different um, Gnostic-related uh, communities have teachings where um, the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh or Jehovah. Is um, is essentially the uh, uh, Yaldabaoth, the um, the um, 
as you're saying, the, the, the Aristotle's um, un, uh, un, physical unmoved mover, the, uh, Aristotle's, uh, not, not the unmoved mover, it's the, um, anyway, the physical creator, and is the, is the evil creator of the evil material world and so forth, which is a mistake. And that the true creator is the creator of the world of spirit. And so yes, so there is a, that is a tendency often in, in Gnosticism as part of the very elaborate creation allegories and mythologies that Gnostics ultimately make in order to um, describe you know, an essentially uh, perfected Christian Platonist um, worldview. I'm, I'm, I'm just turning it down now, so I, I've got the access to this now. Michelangelo says, what did, why was Q forgotten and never mentioned by other authors if it was such an important and quoted text? When Q was, when was Q probably lost? Was it written in Greek? So yes, it was written in Greek. Um, so it would have been lost right away. So within the first, um, uh, you know, so if it would have been written, let's say, as early as the 50s or 60s, um, it may have been out of circulation already by um, the middle of the second century. So it just was not copied. Almost all texts are lost, by the way. So why would it be lost? Um, why would this one in particular, if it's important, be uh, lost? Let's say if you have in your library, you have Q. And let's say you also have a copy of Luke and you also have a copy of Matthew. And it turns out there is nothing in Q that let's say isn't in Luke. So you have an, so like this book isn't as valuable to you because as you read it, so let's say there's nothing in it that you are not already getting out of reading, let's say Luke or Matthew, your favorite gospel, whichever that is. Um, and so as a result of that, if you have to spend time getting a copy of it or making a copy of it. Like somebody comes to your library and they want to copy one of your books and they read it and they're like, oh, I've already got this because I've already got a copy of, of Luke. I've got everything that's in this text. Why would I need this shorter version? What I would think of now is a shorter version of Luke. So for that reason, the Gospel of Mark was almost lost. So people were not copying Mark um, even though it's so much more important and because it's the first gospel and so forth. And the reason why is because uh, almost everything that's in Mark you could already get out of Matthew and Luke. And so, uh, and so it wasn't worth copying to a lot of people, especially considering it had this weird ending and so on. And it was not as, as good or as popular. And so it's very normal for um, the way uh, ancient texts work to take a text because uh, every time you copy a book, it's not just like you can download it to your Kindle or print it on a printer and so forth, and it's always the same. Every time you have to make a new book, you've got to copy it by hand and every, every single time. And so as long as you're doing that with an um, imperfect book, you might write and expand the book every single time. Or if you have a book, you might be taking notes and writing more notes in between the lines. And the next time you make a copy, all of those lines, all those notes might get incorporated into the text. So expanding texts is way more normal than not in the ancient world because of uh, the process of, of copying and so forth. And it was very, very common when a book you know, gets absorbed into another book that it's lost. If you read almost every, um, almost every ancient history text, uh, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll point out that you know, such and such an author, Plutarch or somebody like that, is writing late, but he had access to all of these texts that are all lost. Uh, and, so, and so Plutarch may be preserving um, you know, some good history with his late stuff uh, because he had access to texts you know, that get copied over and, uh, and again get included into the later texts that survive. St. Brush writes, do uh, the sayings of the hypothetical Q appear in other non-canonical gospels? So um, a very good article that I just read uh, in a journal that, um, that argues that um, the epistle of James which includes a lot of these sayings of Jesus, although they're not attributed to Jesus, but it's the same sayings clusters um, that they provide, that they are circulating there in James as an independent witness to Q. So in other words, that, um, that maybe the 
author of James had read a Q document or had access to um, Q teaching, <coughs> excuse me, had access to Q teachings. Um, so it's possible, for example, uh, that they appear in James. Uh, do, does any of the other non-canonical <coughs> gospels, I'm sorry, have access to Q? I don't, I don't think that anyone else has argued that. So I do think that we have uh, a possibility with James, um, the author of James having access to that. So uh, Beat Beat Inc. says, can we say with certainty there is no confirmed sayings of Jesus? N no. Um, no, I don't think so. Um, I think that uh, we can't say, there's a lot we can't say with certainty, I mean, with, with, about the historical Jesus. I think we say with certainty there was a historical Jesus and he had teachings. And I think that um, we can, I mean, we can say, I think that there are lots of teachings of Jesus that uh, I think almost everybody almost all scholars of the historical Jesus would say are sayings of the historical Jesus. It's not by any means all of the sayings that are attributed to Jesus, but there are some of these within there, like, you know, blessed are the poor or something like that, uh, for theirs is the kingdom. Uh, I think that those kind of sayings are ones that I think almost all uh, scholars of the historical Jesus would, you know, say are almost certainly sayings of Jesus. I mean, in terms of 100% uh, confirmation of anything, it's some, that's not really possible because Jesus doesn't have any, um, didn't write anything, right? And so these are all uh, later texts that are preserving teachings of Jesus. Um, and so, you know, we can't 100% confirm anything like that because of that, but I think uh, that the preponderance of evidence and the um, certainly a scholarly consensus would be that many of the sayings do um, preserve something similar to what Jesus would have taught. Uh, Nadav Kravitz says, were the stories of the desert temptations and other non-saying non -saying material likely part of the original Q, uh, what would be its genre then? So, so, so yes, so the desert temptation story, there's a, a story of um, Jesus tempted in the desert and that is not in it's uh, very brief in Mark. It's not, not really in Mark. Uh, the narrative that we have of that is in Matthew and Luke, and both of them are pulling from Q. And so when I said that um, there is very little narrative um, connecting the sayings in Q, I didn't, it's not that there's none, because there's one of them that you've pointed out. There's a couple other ones, too, where there, where there are actual um, narrative events that are happening. Um, the temptations really are, um, you know, <coughs> I'm sorry, there's a lot of, it's almost like a parable. And it could, it, so there is a lot of a three, a threefold dialogue here that Jesus is having uh, with the devil. And in every case, Jesus retort, answers the devil's temptation. Again, it's a threefold thing, just like a parable. Uh, it's a story, uh, narrative story. So it's, in other words, it's not an actual narrative event. It is a, um, it's a story that's like a parable, although it's not a parable because it's, it's told as though Jesus is doing this. Um, and then Jesus answers every time with a quote from the, from the Septuagint, from the Hebrew Bible. And so it's a, um, I think it's still broadly within the, you know, I, mean, I think we can call Q a sayings document, even if that's a let's say, a narrative element that's not technically a saying within it. And there's a couple other narrative elements, like you say. There's a couple other stories like that. There's some little story things that are in, in uh, Thomas, too. And so by calling it a sayings gospel, we're talking about its preponderance of its um, content, not 100% not of its content. Because even in some cases, it's like the disciples are coming and they ask a question. Well, that's a narrative, even if it's, even if it's a a tiny narrative that is really only there to set up the saying, you know. Uh, Winston Barquez says, if there are variations in Matthew and Luke on a saying in Mark, does that mean that they are from Q? So not always. So uh, generally speaking, if there's a, so generally speaking, if Mark has a thing and then Matthew and Luke have something similar, 
um, they might just independently be correcting Mark. So Mark, they don't like often, Mark doesn't, uh, Mark doesn't use a lot of subordinate clauses. Mark is always talking in the past tense, doesn't know Greek very well. Luke is a much, you know, much uh, more sophisticated Greek speaker and so forth. Uh, Luke uh, knows how to quote the Septuagint a lot better, the Bible a lot better than Mark, and so they will uh, follow Mark but silently fix Mark. And so that doesn't mean it comes from Q um, when they're doing that. Uh, and, so, and so in a couple cases, there are things when there, something exists in both Q and Mark, and so then, and so then what'll happen is that they'll glom the Mark and Q versions together in their gospel or something like that. But in general, if it's in Mark, uh, I would say as a rule of thumb, it probably means it's not Q. So usually it's something that's in Matthew and Luke both together and not Mark, that's Q as your rule of thumb. Um, are there sayings that are exclusively from sources known only to Matthew or Luke, Winston asks. So yes, so there's a bunch of sayings that are, um, that are in, that's why I call it the Matthew and only or Luke and only material. So, so these are uh, things that are not uh, found in so it's, let's say, something that is found only in Luke, but it's not found in, the, um, in Mark, and it's not found in Matthew, and it's not found in John. And so, for example, the, the, the wonderful uh, parable of the prodigal son, it's only in Luke. You know? So this is a Lucan-only material, and it doesn't have any um, attestation anywhere else other than Luke, Lucan material. And uh, same thing like in Matthew, I think an example is like uh, the, uh, I think the lamp, the, the lambs and the goats, I think, is only in Matthew, for example. Um, so, like the uh, when they, uh, you know, when they when you're at, being asked, um, you know, when did you, when did you, uh, when did we see you, Lord? Uh, and they didn't know, you know, and so they're separated into the the lambs and the goats or something. So, in other words, there's there whether that's the one. I'm 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 just trying to pull these from the top of my head. But in any event, yes, there's Matthew and only material and Luke and only material. Uh, Nadav Krasovitz also asks, does Q show any influence by or similarity to other known sources, particularly Jewish sources? Um, so yes, um, definitely. Uh, um, an example would be uh, Q seems to be um, building off of Jewish, contemporary Jewish wisdom literature. And so um, so, for example, the author of Q or Jesus um, may have been aware of, Jesus is not the author of Q, but if Q, uh, uh, the author of Q is preserving Jesus' uh, sayings, uh, presumably. And so uh, the source here of the sayings may have been um, aware of, uh, for example, Sirach, uh, which is one of the apocryphal uh, Jewish wisdom sources that is within the, a couple hundred years had been written and circulating, and it is maybe specifically turning some of this wisdom literature and wisdom tradition on its head. So instead of, um, instead of saying things like the, those wisdom sources will say, you know, if you want to be wise, you, you have to be careful who you lend money to. If you're going to lend money to a deadbeat, you're you're going to end up in the poorhouse yourself because, uh, you know, because you'll never get that money back. You know, don't throw good money after bad, kind of thing. Whereas Jesus in Q is saying, um, no, don't, don't. Uh, you aren't, you're not going to gain anything in heaven if you lend only to people who can pay you back. You know, even the even the the Gentiles do that. You know, you, so if you want to be part of, you know, if you want to be part of the kingdom, you know, lend to people who. Who you, there's no hope of, you know, giving back to you. So in other words, it's like turning um, uh, this kind of wisdom literature on its on its end uh, in order to create kind of a, uh, a upside down uh, social revolutionary kind of spiritual kingdom as opposed to um, how do you how are you wise in in the in the real world confirming to, conforming to um, uh, you know, the world's kind of expectations and things like that. So I think, yes, the answer is that there is, uh, it's definitely part of the contemporary context of Second Temple Judaism, and it does seem to be engaging in dialogue, for example, with uh, contemporary Second Temple Jewish wisdom literature. 
Um, Leah von Ersik says, do any uh, scholars think the historical Jesus was possibly Gnostic? Um, so there's a great, uh, so Elaine Pagels is a, um, a scholar on Thomas who um, I think would like to draw the Gnostic elements much closer into the historical Jesus and Jesus' movement. And so would like to see Thomas as a very early document that, and make the case that what we see maybe, what I have maybe presented as Gnosticizing elements as being um, part of what the Thomas editor is maybe adding. I think she would like to show, say that instead actually what we're getting a window into a more maybe a closer to Gnostic early Jesus movement at least, uh, and that it's, it's earlier into the tradition. So I, I don't know that there's a huge, I don't know if she has a huge following outside of her making that kind of an argument, but um, it's a really interesting argument. And so I, uh, she's got a lot of, uh, Elaine Pagels, she has a lot of uh, videos and, on YouTube and you should really check that out. I think you'll love it. Um, Slick Trick says, um, is, uh, Jesus, the uh, Judas, the author of the Gospel of Thomas. So, um, so the so the beginning of the Gospel of Thomas says uh, that these are the secret sayings of uh, Jesus that that Didymus, uh, Judas, Thomas uh, wrote, or that Jesus said to Didymus, Judas, Thomas. And so, uh, Didymus and Thomas are uh, words for twin, and so it's it means and the, Judas is the name, so Jude the twin uh, is, is supposedly the author of it. Um, the, the answer is no, that it's not, it, it's not it's, so it could have been, a, if, in this case it's a pseudepigraphic book, it's uh, claiming to have an author who is not the author. Uh, and, so, and so this character of Thomas is um, one of the more famous of the disciples, you know, so the disciples that are the most famous are, you know, Peter, James, John, James, the brother of Jesus, uh, Thomas, uh, Mary Magdalene, and so forth. And so, whereas the um, the jo John community, the Johannine community, which produces the Gospel of John and and other John-related literature, obviously looks to John as their uh, authority. Kind of the, some of the pro other proto-orthodox communities look to Peter and James uh, as you know, like they're kind of their leaders. Um, the Gnostics and Gnosticizing communities um, look to like Mary Magdalene and Thomas as their leaders. And so um, it may be that the reason why um, the Gospel of John, for example, um, makes Thomas into like a doubter is because that the kind of essentially the John community there is is casting, you know, you know, it's kind of looking at uh, uh, Thomas and saying, well, look, these these Gnosticizing guys are, uh, you know, they're 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 they weren't with the program, and so they're kind of denigrating Thomas there, maybe. Uh, in any event, it's 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 the community that is looking to that apostle. Uh, tr or apostolic tradition as a source of authority, but they are not the author of it. We do not have any uh, works by any of the original uh, apostles. Uh, uh, we have a whole, I have a whole um, lecture on the historical apostles, and so we don't have, we don't have their writings. Stephanie Soressi says, how do you explain our love of scripture studies when uh, we are not of inerrant fundamentalist persuasion. I do not believe it is inerrant or our only word, but I love it anyway. Well, um, I, yeah, so I mean, we, if you are, if you do believe, let's say, in, errant, in inerrant fundamentalism, you want to study scriptures, but you, you study it a very different way um, because you prefer, under those circumstances, you want to uh, read all the words and kind of memorize all the words and know them for the, the surface of them. Um, and you want to try to harmonize them. So all of the, you want to get rid of, even though they are totally contradicting each other and, and it's in contradiction, you want to explain that away. You want to make all of these intellectual arguments for why they don't contradict. In other words, you have to create um, a, uh, a vision of this thing that conforms 
the reality of the text to your uh, viewpoint, which is actually not reality-based. So it is a, it's an interesting exercise, but it is the opposite kind of exercise from what, what we're interested in doing here. So uh, we, I think, also um, have a, um, a love for these texts, which, which we have a lot of familiarity with them. But um, it's so interesting when we like continually are able to peel back the onion and look at something else and see how this connects. Um, you know, it's just uh, really empowering, I think, when we kind of can see, look, this, I mean, even when we've done this tonight, today, when I've like shown how all of the different narrative contexts in which the same saying, with little variations, has been completely repurposed in each different text. And so then when you see that, you, you can say, wait a second, now I don't have to take anywhere near as seriously what Matthew says at the end, his own editorial comments at the end about what he says Jesus says it means, because um, we have what Luke says Jesus says it means, and it's totally different. <laughs> and so now it empowers you to, um, to think, well, what do you think it really means? Because we have uh, contradictions at the, at the base level, right? Uh, Termination says, if we don't have uh, Jesus' original teachings, is it it's the same as to say Jesus was a failure, and so I would say no, uh, not at all, because you know we don't have Socrates' original teachings either, and we don't have that very deliberately, for example, on the part of Socrates, because Socrates felt that he was opposed to writing, and he didn't think that it thinks he thought that writing would uh, you know, would freeze the t dialogue when he went, when true learning comes from having a dialogue with people. It uh, doesn't mean that um, Socrates was a failure. We don't have any, um, anything that says, I don't think we have anything to say that the historical Jesus' number one thing was, um, I want my teachings preserved exactly the way I said them, and if I don't, I'm a failure. I mean, that's, a, that's, not, that's not what he was going for, I don't think. We don't have any indication that that's what he was going for, and so, and so I'd say, no, it doesn't mean that he's a failure because he's going for something different. And so, and... Um, did, did it, everything that happened what he wanted to? I mean, I would say no, but, it, but, that's, um, uh, but lots of things happened that were unexpected, uh, and, and we're still talking about it. <laughs> so Andrew Mann says, uh, can we trust modern scholarly reconstructions, in particular Q, as reliable for history? So, so I'm a pretty... Um, I would say I'm, I'm pretty cautious, so I uh, I don't like to get far out from the sources. Um, so Q is a reconstruction, but it is um, it is pretty solidly based on the two um, you know on the two sources that we do have, right? So we have Matthew and we have Luke, and so what we and so the reconstructions that we have are 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 not pulled out of, oh, well, it must have said something like this here, or that kind of a thing. So it's way less um, speculative or reconstructed than, um, than almost any really cool uh, ancient historical building that you're going to go see, which it looks like it's been like that for 2,500 years. But if you see a picture of what it looked like 180 years ago when it was just a bunch of things lying on the ground and now it's all built back and reconstructed. In a lot of cases there is brand new stuff that's put in there and, and, and so on. In this case the reconstruction of Q um, has very little that, that gets put in there or whatever. In other words we have, um, it's reliable because we have, uh, it's still a primary document anyway for our study of Jesus since it's being taken directly from Matthew and Luke, you know, and so, so yeah, I would say yes, and so I wouldn't, um, things that are more fanciful, I generally don't, you know, so I wouldn't, I mean, I, I, I like to stay pretty close to the sources, and so, uh, and so hopefully that's what we're doing here. Beat Beat Inc. says, can you make a special video on the most confirmed sayings of Jesus and what they're, uh, likely made up later. Yeah, sure, we can talk about that. I mean, that is a, um, <laughs> yeah, there are, so there are a bunch of, uh, you know, there's a bunch of scholars who have done that. Um, Leandro was saying there's a, a book called the, um, the Five Gospels by the Jesus Seminar, um, but the problem with that is, uh, 
I don't know how, I don't know, I'm not gonna, uh, I like that resource, but I don't know how methodologically sound their particular, um, the particular central thing. It's an important resource, but they're, the, the way they did the voting on what the most likely thing is, I'm not sure if I agree that that's methodologically sound in terms of coming up with the most reliable answer. What it says is within a group of liberal scholarship, um, the consensus, the consensus about what the most reliable ones are these, uh, and so that's it's a neat book for that reason. And so you'd, I'm sure you'd be find that very interesting, BP. So it's called the Five Five Gospels. Um, Bog Kazde uh, says the historical method is a good subject for a lecture as well. Yes. So um, I have done a lecture on the past, for example, on. Uh, the invention of history, and so more or less how uh, how kind of these things got going, and some of the methodology for history. I certainly have done what lectures also on um, some of the methodology for the academic discipline of literary criticism, which is how we kind of do these, um, let's say, biblical source criticism of these kinds of texts. Uh, and I've also talked about um, the interactions between history. Uh, literary criticism and then archaeology, uh, and so. Uh, but we could bring it all together into a lecture. I think that's a great idea. So thank you so very much. And that has been uh, a great amount of questions. I really appreciate everybody. Uh, uh, if I didn't get to your question, I'm sorry. But anyway, we appreciate everybody who um, who has chimed in and all of your support. And we do not. Ha we're not announcing the next lecture. We're not going to have one next week because I am preparing a. Um, uh, an in-person lecture that I am going to give uh, in Independence, Missouri next month, and I need to get some things uh, written, but I will, we will announce when the next Tuesday lecture uh, will occur and what the topic will be soon. So thank you.